Hi, Debbie. Hi, Renee. So I'll start this interview the way I start with everybody. Um, do you consider yourself to be a data scientist? Uh, yes, I do. I, I must say that I consider myself to be a physicist first and foremost, but definitely slash data scientist. Okay, great. Um, so for people that don't know you yet, um, you've been on TV and you do a lot of science communication and I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, but let's go back to your childhood and we'll go through the whole history and figure out how you got to where you are. So when sure. you were a kid, yeah. So tell us about where you grew up and uh, what your childhood educational experience was like and whether there were any indications early on that you were gonna go into an analytical or scientific type of field. Sure, thanks Renee. So I grew up in Mexico City and I was part of a fairly conservative community. And growing up I was discouraged from pursuing a career in science, especially in math and physics, which were my two favorite subjects in school. And so I was told from a very early age uh, that uh, by my mom and, and teachers in school and friends that liking analytical things was not a typically feminine trait and that you know as time went by and i you know i was in middle school and then high school and i confessed but i really loved math and physics i was told that uh, i should better pick a more feminine career like philosophy that still allowed you to ask questions but was not as uh you know difficult or challenging as a as a career path and uh, so I became, even though I was very good in math, I wasn't the typical whiz kid in school that you know, knew how to solve everything very, uh, you know, the first um, in class, but, but I was you know, definitely in the top uh, two, top three uh, people in, in, in the whole um, school class. And, but I still was not encouraged, so I developed this insecurity and this fear about going and, and trying uh, uh, new things, which is the very essence of doing science and risking uh, working on challenging problems that may not, uh, you may not be great at to begin with. So when it came time to choose uh, a career for college, uh, I had been so discouraged that uh, in Mexico we have the European system, which means you don't have liberal arts where you can take courses from different topics. We have you sign up for four years and you pretty much do only one thing for those four years. So I enrolled in philosophy and I did two years of philosophy in Mexico and I devoured the books about logic, which is quite related to algorithms and computer science and, and mathematical philosophy and all that. And at the same time, I, I was teaching myself a lot of physics on my own time and math and continuing with calculus and, and, and linear algebra and all these things. And uh, behind my parents' uh, back and my teachers' back, basically I applied to schools in the US to, to see if uh, I could study both, finish philosophy and then add physics. And I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to attend Brandeis University, which uh, as you know is a, a small university in, in the East Coast in Massachusetts which absolutely changed my life. And okay, it was great. Well, before yeah. we get there, I want to backtrack a little bit. So when you were going through all of this and being discouraged, was there anybody or any role models you had that you looked up to or that anybody that did encourage you that knew you were doing this on the side or was it really all on your yeah. own? So my dad uh, was a civil engineer. So he was definitely a, a quantitative person. And I think he, he definitely encouraged me. He, more than anyone else and I would visit construction sites with him and discuss how bridges are built and, and calculate uh, they call it the law of efforts it was this kind of old school engineering uh, theory and 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 he would definitely enjoy those conversations with, with me I'm the oldest of three daughters so at least you know he had one of the daughters very interested in that but when it came to, I, I was literally told by my mom who only finished high school that if I studied math and physics, I would probably never be able to get married. Oh, no. 
these were the kind of things. And I know in the U.S. that sounds kind of crazy and, and you know, really old school. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I've seen that stereotype. Uh, persist among different communities and definitely the Hispanic community tends to be a little bit more conservative and so uh, I guess my dad although he encouraged me he still was hesitant about pushing me all the way so my role models were secret were you know Tycho or Tycho Brahe who was a Danish astronomer for some reason he, he was sort of antisocial and lived in a tower and spent many, many years, 30 years doing observations, meticulously recording the story of stars that he observed in the sky. And I was just inspired by him. And I, I always felt that I was going to be this dark room, basement uh, physicist working with, you know, secret equations. And <laughs> I would never be accepted by society. And I, I just, you know, that's interesting I, I, now because you were studying in secret that you imagined yourself living out this full secret life doing science. Yeah, I really did. Yeah. So and what was I it was, like learning on your own? How, how did you teach yourself these things on the side? Yeah. So that actually happened in a pretty extreme way while I was at Brandeis. So I'll tell you the story. I, uh, finally, I arrived in the U.S. and I had this scholarship which paid for all my, my studies, which was a, a big luxury because obviously in Mexico, you know, we probably couldn't have paid a, a, an American uh, university. And, uh, and so, you know, when, when I arrived, I took the courage to take an astronomy course. And this was a very general astronomy 101 course where the there was a large classroom. I was sitting in the back. There were a hundred people. And the teaching assistant was a man from India by the name of Rupesh, who was a, a, a PhD student at Brandeis. And Rupesh and I became friends over time. And he told me that uh, I definitely had a lot of curiosity and, and talent for asking questions about physics and thinking about nature. And, and he said, you're not the typical student that just wants to get an A in the class and, and you know, you want to do, uh, you want to ask questions and, and your curiosity is unending. So I think perseverance is the key to success, not innate talent, but perseverance. And that really caught my attention. And I, one day we were walking in Harvard Square and I teared up a little bit and I looked at Rupesh and I said, I just don't want to die without trying. I don't want to die without trying to do physics. I may not succeed, but I, I want to give it a go. So he called his advisor at Brandeis, who was the head of the graduate uh, student committee, Dr. Wardle. I'm never going to forget him. And, and he, Rupesh said, I have this crazy student. No, I'm kidding. But he said, <laughs> I have this, this student. She only has a scholarship for two years. And the normal time uh, needed to complete the physics major is four years, as you know. And she, uh, but she really wants to switch from philosophy to physics. What can we do? So he called me into his office and he, at the end of the conversation, he, he first said, Ed Witten, who's the father of string theory, a very reputable physicist, had done the same thing. He switched from history to physics. So he said, there's president, even though in my head I was like, yeah, but he's a super genius. There's no <laughs> I can achieve that. He handed me a book, which was alien language to me. It was called Div, Grad, and Curl, which is vector calculus. And he said, if by the end of the summer, you are able to master the topics in this book and we'll give you a test, we'll let you skip through the first two years of the physics major. Wow. So you can fly. So Rupesh, an amazing man, devoted that summer to my success and, and he was my mentor and my tutor and every single day we sat together and we had no time so we did derivatives on a Saturday, integrals on Sunday, first three chapters of classical mechanics on Monday, etc. You, you get the idea. And so I learned uh, that you can learn a lot of things on your own and to really be self-reliant and responsible for my own learning. And uh, I tell you this story because uh, at the end of the, the summer, I passed the test and I was able to later complete both majors uh, in those two years of physics and philosophy. And it's a beautiful story because I always wanted to pay Rupesh for all his mentoring and, and believing in me and, and the tutoring he was doing. And he said the only that, well, first he said a story when he was growing up in India, in Darjeeling, uh, 
which is high in the mountains, there was an old man that used to climb up uh, to his home to teach him and his sisters math, English, and the tabla, which is a musical instrument. And he said the old man told him the only way that the family could ever pay him is to do that with someone else in the world. And that's sort of how my, he passed the torch to me and my mission in life became to encourage and inspire other minorities, especially women who, like myself, feel that very attracted to STEM fields, but for some reason or another feel that they cannot achieve their dreams. So that, that, that was the whole thing. But learning uh, on your own is something that I, I had to do on my own and, and uh, I greatly enjoyed. Yeah, that's great. So did that inspire you to right away go into science communication and teaching and talking to other people that have been like you? Or did you continue in your education first to get further along? What was your next step? Yeah, so my next step uh, after Brandeis was uh, that I was so hungry for doing more physics. And I realized despite what anyone had told me, in my upbringing, I was good at it and I wanted to pursue it and I was in love with it. I, I could see myself doing nothing else in life. My passion was uh, unlimited. And so I applied to PhD programs in the US and I got accepted to Stanford in the West Coast and I started to work on, on my PhD and that's when I, I became more attracted to science communication because I realized during the program that uh, not only I didn't, didn't, I did not have the same background that, that uh, a lot of the other kids had because, you know, clearly I had done a physics major in two years versus having done physics since you're five years old and constantly winning math competitions and whatnot. And so uh, I was aware of those challenges. I also was aware of the fact that I needed to do a lot of work on my own to pass the qualifying exam and all that. And I became aware that I wasn't the only one uh, ex who had experienced discrimination for being a minority in a quantitative field. And so that really inspired me to, to be a role model and to start, uh, you know, doing things on the side. I started to, to go to high schools in the area, uh, especially where there were Hispanics and speak in Spanish to them and offer them uh, a, a more vast and, and ample idea of what being a scientist is like and, and the joys of discovery and finding things out. And from there, um, you know, after graduating, um, from my PhD at Stanford, I moved to New York. And once I, I came to New York, I was doing uh, two postdocs at Columbia and NYU in applied math and physics. And that's when uh, being in New York exposed me to a very different community of people. And there were lots of media people that I was meeting. And I started tweeting and I started social media. And then I, I from, from there, I, somebody one day told me there's a TV show by National Geographic looking for female physicists under 35 years old who want to be on camera and explain physics. And I was like, me? And um, I, I applied for it. I don't know how many people applied, to be honest. And uh, the next day, they, they called me probably just by fluke that nobody else applied. I don't know. And, and I started. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, so at this point, you've, you've gone through the whole PhD program, you're a scientist, you're on TV. Um, what did your family think, the ones that had discouraged you? You know, how was their response at this time? So I remember what, uh, it took me six years to complete the PhD at Stanford, which is a long time. I mean, it's average, but the average time, but it, it, it's a long time. And I remember every day, sort of, in my own way, praying, I don't know how to call it, but de deeply wishing that my parents would make it to my graduation day. I was just thinking, please, life, let that day be a full day where they're here. And I'm very happy to say that, you know, both of my, my parents were there and my graduation day, my advisor uh, was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, uh, Bob Laughlin. And my, I also did uh, a lot of work with a mathematician, uh, George Papanicolaou, an amazing, amazing advisor. Uh, we're not going to be there to put the, um, how do you call it? Not the toga, but you know, when you, you get your degree, they... they... Uh -huh, it's like a mantle, I think. I'm not yeah. sure the name of it either. <laughs> 
but they, they, they sort of, and they hand you your diploma and they weren't there. And so I went to a mathematician, Joe Keller, who I adore. And uh, he was already in his late eighties and we had just published a, a paper together, uh, on golf, a calculation of rating golf courses for a popular golf magazine. We were very close and I told Joe, can you please come to my graduation? It would be very meaningful. And he said, you know, I haven't done that in 30 years. I, I hate dressing up. And he literally would wear the same jeans and, a, and the same sweat, green sweater for the six years that I was there. And, and I said, okay, Joe, I understand. It's pretty formal. Don't worry. Somebody else will put the mantle on me. Oh, is it is it hooding? Is it called a hooding ceremony? Hooding, thank you, yeah. yes. Okay. They put the hood on me, thank you. And I'm, as I'm walking down the stairs to receive the hood, I see Joe Keller entering the class, uh, the classroom with his helmet on his, uh, on his bike, because he still <laughs> had it, with his torn jeans and his green sweater, and he comes in, you know, briefly tells um, the, the, the other physicists who were all like fancy and, and dressed up that he's gonna put the hood on me and he stands there all proud and I just burst out crying. And oh. I looked back at the audience and I saw my dad with tears in his eyes and my mom and, and, and friends had flown in from Mexico. I mean, it was like probably one of the best days of my life. and. Um, I, it, it was amazing. I felt that um, I was, and not only for me, but for what it, I became the first Mexican woman to graduate with a physics PhD from Stanford. I was told later by Stanford. And, and so it, it was also a symbol of, I'm, re, I'm here representing all the women that I've met across my life that have told me um, and have asked me, how did you get the courage to do it? How do I do something like that? And I always say, uh, you know, I'm testament that uh, if you put your mind into something, you can, you can do it. There's nothing that a person cannot achieve with great effort, perseverance, hard work, and trusting yourself. So yeah, you, know, and you have such an inspirational story. And it also it's, it's inspiring that you didn't listen to the naysayers, you know, even though, you know, so many people were telling you not to do it or that it, it might, you know, ruin your future relationship prospects or whatever, that you just had <laughs> such a passion for it, you kept going. And yeah. I think that's a commonality among people that, that get to that point, you know, you just have a passion and a love for it and you just don't let anything stop you. Absolutely. I remember when my colleagues, in physics were having a challenging time in the PhD, which we all do at some point. And they would call their families and then their moms or their parents would say, oh, but your father, who was probably a professor, went through that as well. You can do it. And, uh, you know, they were just coming back to the lab and being inspired. I would call home and the first thing I, I would be told is, I told you you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, well, we were right just come back to Mexico and you know have a more normal lifestyle and it was so hard to do it despite all that um, well naysaying mm -hmm. yeah wow so now that you know that that um, you know it's so helpful to have somebody encouraging you through it what type of things do you do now to encourage others yeah, so thanks for asking that. Uh, so nowadays, I, I used to work with, uh, I was an ambassador for Technovation Challenge, which is the longest running and largest tech competition for high school girls from underserved backgrounds. And we uh, didn't just operate in the U.S., but also in many different countries. And what it is is a, a three-month program where we uh, take high school girls and they, they are taught three things, how to create an app that solves a problem in their community, and that it, it, it used to be science-based and, and something that's interesting. Two, how to create a business model around it. And three, how to pitch their idea in front of a committee of investors and high-tech entrepreneurs. And at the end, uh, we had pitch night, which uh, was, took place, takes place still in San Francisco, and the winner, uh, gets uh, $15,000 by Google, who's uh, the, one of the main sponsors, and their app gets developed 
professionally, they get help. And so I mentored uh, one of my amazing mentees. She's a, a, a girl uh, from Mexico that I took under my wing because I saw how, how talented she was. I met her at a high school in New York and, and uh, she was the winner of Technovation Challenge in 2013. And they created a company and she was 16 years old and had an LLC uh, based on the app that these team of, of girls created and so that was fantastic. So I, I've continued to mentor women very closely one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. It takes uh, a lot of time and effort but it's one of the, the things that I feel I live for. Besides that, uh, I've been involved uh, with Girls Inc. Um, a, a few women and myself developed the first data science curriculum for high school girls, again of underserved backgrounds in the country and we've uh, it's been de deployed, it's called Giga3 uh, program, and it's been deployed uh, in 10 high schools in New York, and Girls Inc. is, is planning on expanding the, the program uh, uh, in a very aggressive way. And so, great. Yeah, if you could send me a link to that, I'll definitely share it in case there's any teachers or people listening that could implement that in more schools. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and just, um, you know, from also from uh, working at Metis, uh, right now, we're a data science training company, and you know, I, I we have in place a scholarship for women and minorities. Uh, we try to host events for organizations that support minorities. Like next in two weeks, we're having Women Who Code um, come. Uh, we're hosting an event, so you know, there are multiple ways in which I, I try very hard to inspire minority minorities to become data scientists or scientists or whatever they, they, yeah, they dream. That's, that's great. So since you talk, brought up data science, um, let's talk a little bit about your data science history. Um, what type oh. of work did you do as a data yeah. scientist, you know, right out of college? And then, you know, I know you've transitioned into some different roles over time. So kind of walk us through the type of work you've done. Sure. So I don't know if you've heard, but a lot of physicists, end up working in Wall Street. <laughs> and um, I believe it's a remnant of when, of the Cold War, when there were very few positions uh, in academia. And so the departments were shrinking. And unfortunately, they have continued to shrink in many areas, especially I'm a theoretical physicist. And uh, having a, getting a job in theoretical physics is, is very, very hard. The numbers are, are against you. And so uh, it was that. I did get some offers to, to become a professor. And uh, even though the, the likelihood is, is low and, and people are told that it takes an average of six postdocs after your PhD each one of two years in order to get a, a physics job. And, of course, it depends what... Um, experimental physicists, depending on what they do, have it a little bit easier, but still it's, it's a tough dilemma. And when I was uh, doing my postdoctoral fellowships, especially at the Courant Institute at NYU, I, I did an experiment once where we went to a conference and I was the only woman and uh, it was in Rhode, Rhode Island. And I remember staying behind when we were all going to go to dinner. And I had been writing a paper with one, research paper with one of the um, of the men in the, at the conference. And uh, so I felt that we had, you know, some sort of rapport and we were friends. And uh, I just made, I said, I'm gonna stay behind when everyone was leaving the bar where we were drinking, um, you know, just a glass of wine or something beforehand. I remember that I, I don't really like beer, but I drank a beer just to be one of them and fit in. <laughs> And uh, they were all leaving, and I said, I'm going to just stay behind for a few minutes and see if they miss me, if somebody looks back or if somebody calls me. Nobody looked back. They went to a restaurant, and they went to dinner, and I stayed in the hotel. And I remember it was a very cathartic moment for me because I knew already I was pretty miserable socially. I was spending every you know, waking hour, every hour of my, my, my life in, in the lab, you know, doing computational uh, applied math and physics. So I was devoting my life to this field. I had very little time for any other type of relationships. And what I was getting back in terms of intellectual stimulation was huge. But what I was getting back in terms of, you know, nurturing my soul and me as a person was very, very little. I was almost uh, not said hi to on an everyday basis in the building. And, you know, I just didn't, 
feel that um, the academic environment was for me. I was already uh, starting to do a little bit of media and uh, there was, uh, it was stressful to try to combine it with a full time, uh, you know, professorship and, and all that. And so I decided that I wanted to look for other opportunities outside of academia. And once I decided that, um, I also had the issue that many foreign physicists uh, have, which is the fact that I needed a green card. Uh, I had visa after visa, and as you know, immigration uh, is can be tr a troublesome issue in the U.S., and so I didn't want to be in a precarious situation. I wanted to get a green card as soon as I, I could, and Wall Street um, was very aggressively interviewing PhDs in physics and math, and they called Stanford, and they called um, Columbia, and I would get on phone calls with hedge funds, and they would interview me. And so, you know, when it came time to uh, make a decision and to, I finished my postdocs and I uh, took a job uh, at a hedge fund, AQR, called Applied Quantitative Research, which is full of physicists. And I was like, okay, I'm one of them. And basically all it was was translate all the math and physics and, and programming that I was doing before and just basically apply all of that to a different subject, which was finance. But it was still, you know, heavily quantitative and numerical. And I did that. Um, unfortunately, the hedge fund environment was also a little bit uh, tough. And I was there in 2008 when the quant uh, meltdown happened in finance. So it was uh, extremely stressful. And I ended up working for six years at MSCI, which is, stands for Morgan Stanley Capital International, a spin-off of Morgan Stanley. It's an independent company that creates risk models. So I was building models and working with a lot of financial data and other alternative data. And one and, and I, I, I very much enjoy the intellectual challenge, but I didn't really I had never cared about money in my life. And money was not a subject I wanted to study or 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 deal with. So although I was doing well, I was internally again uh, sort of dying inside. I, I was frustrated by the field. And one day I, you know, after meeting uh, my friends from Stanford, who many, many of them had uh, transitioned from academia, very few of us stayed in academia and they transitioned to the tech world. My friend Jonathan Goldman, uh, who's brilliant, uh, was working at LinkedIn as a data scientist. And I told him, wow, I really want to do something like that. And, uh, but I feel like I, have, I don't have the skills. How am I going to become a data scientist? And he basically, I remember, told me, what you're doing is data science. Mm -hmm. It's a small portion of it, but you're working with data. You're building models. You're using computer programming to test those models. And you're um, you know, basically validating results with reality in, mm -hmm. in finance. So I was like, wow, oh, and you're using a lot of statistics, which is essential. And I was like, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. So uh, I transitioned and I started applying for jobs in, fine, in, in traditional data science. And uh, I took a job for a year and a half at ThoughtWorks. I was a principal data scientist. And ThoughtWorks is a boutique consulting company that is very well known for software engineering. And we were sort of trying to launch the data science program and get clients to, um, you know, buy in our services. Uh, and so uh, I very much enjoyed the switch in subject. I, I was now working in projects that had to do with retail, healthcare, which uh, is also a passion of mine, and, and, you know, many different data sets. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, but consulting can be difficult you know if there are clients that are interested in the projects then it's great and if there are no clients in that moment um you know it's it gets difficult to these days to convince corporations of the be great benefits they can have by hiring data scientists and so um i decided that i wanted to go back to a more educational um field having to do with data science uh, because my passion has always been to teach people, to help people succeed in life and to fulfill their dreams in STEM and quantitative fields. And so 
I was at Strata at the uh, big data uh, conference in New York about a year ago, and I met my friend Kathy O'Neill, who's a, an amazing data scientist, and also my friend Hilary Mason, who's a great role model for me. And I remember talking uh, to them, and especially to Kathy, I said, I'm not happy in consulting. I, I really want to do something more fulfilling. And she says, oh, I have the perfect job for you. And introduced me to Jason, who's Jason Moss is a CEO uh, at Metis, and I really clicked with him. And uh, it just, it was a company that touched all the points that I cared about. It had to do with data science. I could have an input into creating curriculum, educating the next generation of, of data scientists. It had, uh, you know, a, a corporate training component where I could still have contact with companies and train people there. And, and it had the, the uh, ability to, to be a leader, the, you know, which is something that I've uh, greatly enjoyed and sort of making big decisions. And, and it's sort of my baby, uh, uh, you know, medicines as a company, I can grow it in different directions. Like I can come up with different ideas for products, for educational products, such as, um, you know, a, a course for uh, data science for scientists that are transitioning or for people in finance. Yeah, so, so let's come back and talk about Metis later. I want to get more into what it is and how people can, you know, get involved and, and how you're involved there. But before we get to that, you had talked a lot about um, going from academia to industry and having all these different experiences in, in industry. Um, and a question yeah. that I get often is about people transitioning from different roles. So what advice do you have for people that um, you know, either have been in academia as postdocs or, you know, had originally planned to be professors and might not be going into that now, um, or just people coming out of school that want to go into sure. industry. Um, what advice do you have for helping them find that role that is their passion and not getting stuck somewhere like if they're not interested in money, getting stuck in finance? You know, how, how do you... Yeah, I think you that's know, a great, great question, Renan, and thank you for asking. I think... Uh, the unknown can be very scary. And I think when somebody's coming out of school or somebody's out of a master's or a PhD program, uh, they know a lot about a specific area. And data science uh, can seem pretty intimidating. And that is because the people uh, who are doing data science are in, have incredible expertise uh, but what people don't realize is that sometimes that expertise is in a pretty narrow area. Mm. When one hears the word data science, people think they have to know every single algorithm and right. be amazing at machine learning and, and uh, you know, regressions and big data tools, Hadoop and Spark, and know everything really, really well. Because normally when one studies one field in college, that's kind of what you're expected to do. Mm -hmm. And so what I often find is that people don't take the leap because they're afraid they're not going to be good enough. They're afraid of the competition out there. They think, you know, I, a lot of PhDs uh, have the statistics and the uh, analytical background and the critical thinking, but they may not have the computational skills and they get terrified by that. Or... A lot of programmers have all of that, but they, they're terrified of the statistics portion of it and, and, and the critical thinking about problems and, or dealing with managers. So what I often tell people is that, you know, taking the leap is the hardest part, that deciding to leave, uh, to do a career switch uh, in, into a unknown or undefined as of now uh, career, such as data science, uh, is the, tough, the toughest part. Once you're in it, and I see it, we, we have an immersive boot camp where students come from very different backgrounds and they all fear different things. But once you're in it and you're doing things, I remember I, I took a course uh, to, to be able to, to, to even just know what data science was about, even though I knew certain areas already and I had been doing uh, many things, uh, I, I didn't know that I knew it. <laughs> and so, you know, just taking that leap uh, and, and trusting that uh, you're going to be a fast learner uh, is, is huge. And then the second thing that I see is, is 
that data science, you ask 10 people what it is and you'll get 20 answers. Everybody defines what's important to them. We get recruiters constantly telling us, if your students don't know uh, A-B testing, I would never hire them. But then another recruiter says, if they don't know big data, I would never hire them. So, you know, catering uh, to a very complex market and to corporations that don't know yet what they can derive out of hiring data scientists is a complex problem that will get solved with time. And so for now, what I recommend people is choose a program or choose a job that is sort of a little bit more challenging than uh, you know, what you would expect from a job that feels very comfortable, but don't choose something that is too far ahead meaning that everything is foreign. Like I remember, you know, in, in, even in finance, uh, learning the, the lingo and what indexes are, indices are and whatnot is, is complicated. So just choose something that you have to do quite a bit of learning, but yet some areas feel comfortable. And practice, practice, practice. There's nothing that's going to substitute that. And I'd like to weigh in on that, too, because I had a similar experience where, um, you know, I've been a data analyst for years and in the in the fundraising, nonprofit fundraising area, and I got a master's degree in systems engineering, and I realized there was a big overlap with data science, and I got really interested in data science instead of becoming a systems engineer. And, you know, I spent a year after finishing grad school just doing data science, like, on the side, you know, doing it at, on, on weekends and evenings at home and learning the stuff and, and getting immersed in the language of it because the terminology is one of the biggest things to overcome and that's one reason it sounds scary. Another thing that's common is so many, like you said, people think they need to know everything and that's why I started um, Data Sci Guide, my website, because um, the, a lot of people feel overwhelmed because you start researching data science and like you said, there's, there's the data engineering aspect and there's so many different algorithms and ways to apply them. Um, and I even uh, applied for a couple jobs where in the interview, it was clear that they're looking for a statistician and I'm not a statistician, though if I have a textbook and some practice, um, I can clearly do the statistics. I, I you know, got good grades in, in master's level statistics in college, but um, I, I had to convince myself that I was ready to apply. And you know, when you hear, you feel like you're not quite getting in in a few areas, it's hard to overcome that. But then once I started picking exactly what you said, picking a, a top a job that was just beyond what I felt comfortable with, but there was enough within the description that I felt like I can definitely sell myself for that. Um, then things started happening for me and I, I got a couple offers where it was like, okay, I, I feel comfortable now that I can be a data scientist. And of course, by the time this episode airs, uh, I will have announced that I actually do have a new position. I'll be working as a data scientist now. So uh, I'm looking forward to all the learning involved in that. And uh, it's so exciting to me to, to have this future. But your advice was right on in terms of my experiences. It, it matched that exactly. So since you now work with Metis, which is a boot camp, tell us about Metis and, and what it's for. Who would, who would be best to look at Metis? Yeah. So the, the first uh, slide correction, and, and you know, a lot of people think it's just a boot camp, is that Metis has four pillars. Okay. And I'm the chief data scientist here. And basically the four pillars are one is the boot camp. You're right. We have an immersive a 12-week program designed for people who want to switch careers and become data scientists. They come from very different backgrounds. Uh, we get 15% of them from quantitative PhDs, but we also get, on the other end, people with very little uh, programming experience who have picked up on their own some stuff, and we, we do require uh, 60 hours of pre-work to to get people sort of on the same level. And, and you know, they, they may have a background in journalism or marketing, but they wanna uh, do data science. And so you're, for 12 weeks, we teach them everything we can about uh, the basics of data science. And then at the end, we help, find, we help them find jobs in industry. So that's our bootcamp. Our second pillar is corporate training. We also go to companies that ask us to do a particular aspect of data science. So it could be a visualization or um, 
classification or recommendation systems. And so we'll go into a company and train a team within the company about that aspect. Our third pillar is professional development. So these are courses that we host uh, at our locations in San Francisco, New York, and Chicago, and they take place in the evenings for six weeks, twice a week uh, normally, and uh, they teach, again, just one aspect of data science. These are for more uh, established professionals who don't want to switch careers but want to learn and become proficient in, in one area. And then finally, we also have an online offering called Explore Data Science. And uh, beyond that, uh, I manage all these uh, four pillars and, and I have 13 data scientists uh, working in, in you know, teaching in, in all, uh, training people in all sorts of ways. And then we're also constantly looking to create new products, new curriculums. Like we have a pulse in the market from all the corporations that we work with, all the, the career, uh, the recruiters that we work with and, and, and and companies that tell us, you know, you know, we uh, we're now looking for data scientists who know uh, this area or this topic very well, and so we may incorporate that into the curriculum if we feel that's a trend, or we may um, you know change things or create a different course around that. So it's all about uh, learning what the trends are, responding to market demands, and preparing people with excellent skills. That's great. And it's kind of funny because just by chance, <laughs> the person that I interviewed before you was Stephanie Rivera, who worked at Booz Allen, and she helped develop the Explore Data Science uh, program that yeah. you guys now have. <laughs> so um, that hasn't yeah. aired yet, but that will have aired just before this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so these four <laughs> pillars, who um, who should, you know, go, go toward, you know, if, if I'm just out of school and want to get a career or if I'm trying to transition, which, where do I go for thisismetis.com? Uh, what, what do I look for? Sure, so if you're just out of school, we get our, ma our majority of applicants for the bootcamp are just out of school, maybe one or two years of work experience, but you know, that, that's uh, the ma majority of the people we cater to. Uh, as you said, go to thisismetis.com and email us. We're a very small company with an extremely hands-on team. So we often set up uh, phone conversations and I mean, students do have to go through an interview process to make sure that uh, they have the required skills and they're not going to feel too overwhelmed during the boot camp. And uh, very often uh, those uh, students get, uh, if they ask, they want to, about having a conversation with a data scientist or with myself and not only with the, with our admissions team, then, you know, we have those conversations and we talk about their career goals and their, perhaps their fears about uh, switching careers to data science. And, and, and so I think just a great start is to email, fill out the form on our site and email or call us and we're always available to help. Okay, great. And then who is the Explore Data Science program aimed at? So Explore Data Science is very much like a lot of the other online courses and uh, it, it's kind of cool because it has a space uh, interface. So you're learning data science as you go along, but, but the chapters are uh, sort of you're exploring galaxies and, and it's, it's pretty cool. The theme is very Star Trek like. Yeah, I've seen and, the interface, it's really beautiful. <laughs> I really love the interface. And that one is aimed at people who are not sure they want to make a career switch. Uh, it's at a much uh, more inexpensive price point. And uh, it's about $100. And you get uh, to use it for a few weeks. It's, it's maybe only four to five weeks. And you get to go at your own pace, at home, at your own hours. You don't have to physically be present. And it's a way to explore, will I like data science? Do I like the kinds of problems that people work on? Do I like to think this way? Can I program comfortably you know, enough to get something going? And so we very much hope that it's not the end uh, of the line uh, program so that people get inspired by the online experience. And from there, they go on to do a boot camp or a, or a course, uh, a professional development course. Great. And tell us more about your role there. So you said you're chief data scientist. Um, what do you do? 
So I manage the team of uh, data scientists. We have all the senior data scientists who are the instructors uh, for the bootcamp and who are also the instructors in the corporate training. Uh, I, I, I work also with designing the uh, work environment. So the way we've been able to attract very good, amazing uh, data scientists is by offering our, our original model, uh, which we now call 211, which is not an ideal name, but it basically means that for two quarters of the year, our senior data scientists teach the bootcamp. But as you can imagine, that's pretty intense. And so for one, uh, the third quarter of the year, uh, they do corporate trainings, their business quarters. So they get to travel and interact with different companies and, and train in different aspects of data science. But then the fourth quarter out of the year, we offer them uh, what's called a passion quarter, which is basically three months where they get to work on whatever they want that has to do with data science. They can publish a book, they can do consulting and, and you know, earn more money if that's what they wish to do. They can uh, work with an academic institution and teach. They can, uh, you know, work on their hobbies and publish blogs about their projects, whatever they want. And so th that, um, and they're obviously paid, so it's subsidized by the company. And so that has allowed us to attract, you know, very uh, special people who are not only great practitioners uh, and want to keep a foot in, you know, doing data science, but are also amazing instructors, uh, which takes different skills. And um, so, you know, okay, so my, my role consists of, you know, managing those the, the quarters and, and the dynamics of the team and how things work. I also uh, am in charge of creating new curriculum for uh, different uh, aspects of the bootcamp and for new products. So especially, you know, working with, for example, my background in Wall Street is coming in handy now because I'm um, interviewing uh, people uh, in finance, in Wall Street, about what the trends are and many different hedge funds and banks are getting into traditional data science and using alternative uh, sources of data rather than just price point and, and et cetera, and, 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 you know, looking at, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, some hedge funds are looking at um, companies that are sending small satellites to surround the earth and are constantly mapping uh, resources on earth like fleet of boats or, or they're looking at weather patterns. It's very, very data intensive, but they're looking into translating the rich data into financial signals. You know, maybe they could trade on agricultural information or they could trade on behavior of fleet, uh, you know, for trade and commerce. And so different aspects of that. And, and, and so, uh, but they may not fit in any of our categories, the boot camp or corporate training. So designing a course for those people is important. So that's part of my role too, to come up with ideas of new demographics in data science and new products and, and the trends. And also, uh, finally, uh, leadership. So uh, getting our instructors to constantly publish, to appear at conferences and be part of the ecosystem uh, of the data science community and, and you know, working in non nonprofit projects and you know, doing social responsibility uh, things as um, as well as uh, you know me participating in in those things as well. So it's a pretty complex, wear many hats kind of role that I, yeah. I really. Enjoy. So your instructor position sounds great, and I'm sure a lot of people listening would be interested. So what do you look for in instructors? How do you select them? So I think people have to be passionate about teaching. Uh, some people after working in data science for a few years decide that they love it, but they, they're hungry for that uh, eureka moment that they see in students when they teach them concepts. And so, uh, you know, I think data scientists are, are a unique bunch of people in that they all tend to be extremely curious, extremely gritty, they're very hardworking, uh, they, they are not comfortable with getting an answer. They want to find out by themselves. And, uh, you know, so, so we get very smart people, very capable people, but we don't often get people who have the ability to spend uh, uh, a lot of effort and time uh, teaching people that are not experts yet. 
And so that's, you know, what I look for is that extra edge, that creativity that people need to have to be able to explain complex concepts in lay terms, but also in entertaining ways. People who go out of their way to make a presentation fun and uh, thinking outside of the box. And then our students uh, do projects, which are great because they, they, they really take into account everything they have learned before. And then they uh, apply all those skills to design their own final project, which is later seen by the, the companies that come to our career day. So I look for uh, people who are committed to uh, growing the skills of other people. And that to me is, is key and it's not always easy to find. And besides that, of course, all the, the typical skills of knowing uh, the curriculum uh, quite well. But we often, uh, we have people who may not be, may be great at 75% of the curriculum, but may not know visualization or big data tools. And that's okay because we often have two instructors and they can complement their skills. And then they're also allowed to take our professional development courses so they can supplement their education constantly learn. Yeah, that sounds great. And so speaking of curriculum, since you do curriculum design, how do you choose what topics to put in your core courses? How do you prioritize what is important for a beginner to learn? That's definitely hard. So I'm very lucky that in our team, uh, we have Lori Skelly, who's a data scientist from Datascope. And Datascope is a, a data science consulting firm in Chicago that came up with our curriculum. They basically were the, the, the first people to work on the initial curriculum. And it, it, I must say it hasn't uh, changed that uh, vastly after that. But in the past couple of years, so what I do is I, I get my instructors in the East and West Coast to write weekly notes. And this is meant to share anecdotal evidence or anecdotal things about um, what, what works in the classroom. Did the students enjoy pair programming? Did the, uh, you know, the NLP or when, so, that, so that's one thing, you know, when the instructors share what works in class and where the students get confused, what students are asking for, for more of and less of, uh, that's one source of information. The second source is the, the, the corporations we work with. A lot of people that come to our career day or have hired data scientists from our programs come back and tell us, you know, many students are very, very strong in this, but I would like them to also know uh, like I said earlier, A-B testing, or I would like them to be much more prepared in, in SQL or GitHub and knowing how to manipulate, uh, you know, different uh, versions of the code, and etc. So then, you know, we take all that very seriously uh, into account. And thirdly, we also look at market trends. So, you know, we see, we, ha we have, we host events all the time. And so we hosted a big data event uh, not so long ago. And we realized that a lot of people were moving uh, from Hadoop to Spark. And so we, uh, we had to, to have discussions on whether we're going to move away from Hadoop or as of now we're teaching both. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we just have it there as an item to look out for. And so just those three sources of information and, and knowing how to weigh the feedback that we get, when is it important? That takes time and talent, I guess, and intuition. So that's how we decide what to include and what to take away, to take out. So. Great. Well, I've been talking to Debbie Barabishas, and it's been great talking to you, Debbie. You have such an inspiring story, and also what you're doing now at Metis is, is really important. So um, how can people find you online, and are there any last uh, takeaways you want to have for this interview? Sure. Well, I want to encourage everyone um, that is interested to reach out to me and to Metis. Uh, I very much uh, enjoy helping people figure things out. And so uh, my website is sciencewithdebbie.com, D-E-B-B-I-E. -E. Uh, I'm on Twitter also as Debbie Bere, B-E-R-E, -E, after Debbie. And, uh, you know, this is medis.com is our, our site here if you're interested in a boot camp or, or hiring data scientists. And Renee, I, I'm a huge fan of your work. So thank you so much for having me on the program. 
Thank you. Uh, and so what final advice do you have? Uh, for instance, what would you tell, uh, you know, the little girl in Mexico that has dreams of doing this type of work in terms of, uh, you know, what to keep in mind throughout all the, the difficult times you're going to have, you know, learning what you need to learn to become a data scientist? To not let anyone take your dreams away. To know that they're there for a reason and you have them because they're part of your essence. And if you choose to not listen to that voice that is telling you one day you're going to pay for it. One day you're going to be unhappy after 30 years of working uh, to get to a goal that wasn't yours to begin with. So just pursue your dreams uh, no matter uh, how hard you think they are in that moment and look for mentors, the right mentors in uh, definite career uh, points are essential and I'm always here uh, for help or any other questions or brainstorming. Okay, great. Thank you so much and thank you for all the great advice. Thank you, Renee.